burning our way through hour number three of the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome back inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and uh, it's a really a high honor to continue to expand out and connect with my peer group, uh, cats that are continuing the lineage of melodic improvisation in their own way. Uh, as we know that uh, the genre of jazz is really no longer uh, popular music in our culture, and there's a, a new authentic group of cats that are um, percolating in different regional sections of the country that are kind of doing it in their own way. They might be playing <clears throat> cosmic rock uh, and stretching out and improvising. And in many ways, that is jazz, too. And um, after 4,000 radio interviews and being on the road and doing a lot of Facebook Live interviews, uh, it has been uh, comforting for this host to realize that the music will never die and will continue on. And some of it's due to my guest today, Brian Rashap. Welcome to The Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks a lot, man. How you doing? Well, it's great to connect with you, man. We uh, I don't know if you uh, that was the middle of a of a jam on the Tune Cities with uh, Stu Allen, Lebo, Lebowitz, Brian Rashap, and Danny Loring at the uh, at the bar at Terrapin Crossroads. That was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh, from uh, I don't know what year this is from, but it's just you know I just uh, yeah, it's just it's fantastic to. Um, to connect with you, you know, I just I would love you to talk a little bit about <clears throat> your concept of of music and whether you believe that uh, you guys uh, this this collective of of cats in the you know North Bay or in the Bay Area are in fact putting your own stamp and your no, your own new musical vocabulary on things. You know, I would I would have to say we are. I think. Um you know, I'd, I'd love to speak for everybody, but speaking for myself, I, uh, I, I, I truly, I try to throw a wrench into whatever we're doing and, and, and kind of bring a, about that possibility to, to make it our own, to, to create our own thing. Playing with Stu, playing with Stu is, I know listening to him and, and watching him is amazing, but playing with him is is just the same thing. I, I love that here's this guy that's that's really dedicated himself to to bringing this music to the masses, to bringing people into beautiful songs that have been written, amazing jams that have been created. And one thing that I, I love is that while we're doing something um, – even like cities or, or that solo section. Um, I like to make a left turn. <laughs> I like to, to throw something in there that's a little more aggressive or a little bit <laughs> different than what you would usually be ready to hear and accept in your ears. And like for a lot of guys, you do that and you get these looks on the stage of like, the hell are you doing? <laughs> and with Stu, you, you don't even get really I, – I feel like I don't get a look. I get like oh, – hang on, my dog is – come on back. That's fine, little, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Dogs are important. Good, good Dogs boy. are important, yeah. He, he's a good boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I feel that with Stu, it's almost like his head goes down a little further into his guitar and his hair just kind of starts moving a little bit more. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I yeah. recognize this excitement um, of like this is somewhere that this song has never gone before by you know, anybody playing this song covering the song and so i do feel like we're putting our stamp on it i I'll, I'll never be able to play uh like these guys you know that we all listen to our, our heroes and and i think and i think that's great i think it's cool and i, I don't want to play like them so yeah we we definitely throw a stamp on there and it's a it's an amazing uh musical situation um I think uh, Tony Leone told me in our interview, he said that Phil Lesh said that uh, the idea is never play the same song the same way once. And right, I, exactly. I, and I and that to me is the most 
important. You said what's accepting. You said something very interesting. You said, I'm not going to play. I'm going to throw a wrench into it. I'm going to play with something that's that's not necessarily accepted in people's ears. And I mean, I think we're based, I mean, I, I'm 40 years old. So I just, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how much reprogramming or deprogramming we have to do for audiences like my daughters who, uh, you know, I'm not even talking about playing dead covers. I'm talking about just music in sure. general. Uh, the idea of uh, how we got to a point uh, with uh, certain with melodic music, especially improvisational music, where we sit and stare at facility as opposed to letting the body dance. And I realize I don't want to be totally general yeah. because there's, but I mean, all fair, I'll tell you a story about Terrapin Crossroads later that was a little bit shocking me, but it's gotten to a point now where sometimes it just feels, not necessarily the bar gigs, but just when I go see gigs now, Anywhere I was in, two, you know, I live in Tucson. I go see blues jams. I got people coming up, women coming up, tapping me on the shoulder, saying, "Can you please sit down? I, I'm trying to. I'm, you're blocking my view." And it's like I'm here to, I'm here to dance, man. I'm here to have an out of body experience. I mean, this is cathartic yeah. stuff. And I'm just asking you, do, like, do you, do you, does any of that resonate with you? And if so, how important um, is it? to put stuff in people's ears that they are not accepting of. I think it's super important. I mean, it, if you didn't do that, or I should say if, if people haven't done that to me, whether it's a friend showing me something or um, a, a band that I'm watching or, or listening to, um, I would never, I'd never grow. If, if, if it isn't something new, I think it, it becomes stagnant and, you almost you almost like give in to your own idea of um, nostalgia at that point and even nostalgia I think is something where something that you heard 30 years ago that kind of brings you back to where you were today it, 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 it's it's still not doing that it's still a new experience so I think expanding your ears and listening to new things all the time and new ways of things being uh, played or, or presented is the best. There's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still, I've got this cold that won't go away. I think it's making, I think it's making you sound, it it's not, it's making you sound more, more uh, uh, authoritative. So don't worry about it. Yeah, no, that's a good boy. I'm still talking to the dog, but kind of yelling at him. No, um, uh, uh, I, I just got hip to, um, a 2017 unplugged album by aha that band from the 80s sure yeah and we all know that song take on me or take me on i i I don't even know what the real name of the song is but in this unplugged version the song is completely deconstructed and it's the most something that i'm familiar with there is a bit of nostalgia in it. It's, it's n- nothing more. It's so powerful at this point, hearing it that way, I can't hear it any other way. And I mean, my family and my wife and I bought the album and we listen to it all the time now. And it's something that uh, not hearing it in that new light and that new way, I, I think it would be robbing people of, of an amazing tune. Yeah, so, yeah I think sitting down is not really the right thing to do like watch the band with your ears and and let the music flow around the person that's standing in front of you experiencing it for themselves in their own way um yeah i mean i this is it's aha take on me is what it's called um take on me right yeah yeah and uh i have to check this i'm not that hip to it but you know this is a big part of my show i don't care if i've interviewed jim keltner when he was on the road with Rye Cooter or, you know, the M1 Dishi band with, with Julian Priester and, and Buster Williams and Billy Hart when they were playing with Herbie, you know, there was this idea of going there as, a, and, you know, Stu does this really well. And I think a lot of the younger cats do, you know, in the, in the uh, milieu of the Bay, but it's the idea of saying, <clears throat> you know, it, the idea of a musical situation, I mean, you know, okay, you go to see some sort of classical concert or something, fine. I understand you want to sit there and, sure. you know, and met and whatever. But I'm saying, 
the musicians have to get to a place first where they are in tune and then that resonates to the audience and then back to the musicians and that's the raising of the collective consciousness and and i just wanted you to talk about even recently this year or, or just an experience where you felt like there was uh, where the i think ultimately that's what i'm trying to get at is like it's not this is not music is not made for pacification. The bu the music that Rashat makes is not for pacification. So it's made for burning. So I mean, can you talk about an experience recently, or just in your mind that comes to mind when you when the collective consciousness was was raised on all levels? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is actually this is this is interesting. So currently, I'm playing with. Uh, this band, the Mother Hips. Uh, Are you serious? You're playing killer. with them? Wait, were you playing with Loy Icono and those cats? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love. I didn't know you were playing with them, dude. That's sick. Yeah. <laughs> it, it. Trust me, it's 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 sick on uh, many levels. Yeah, no, it's that's a good music. thing. I mean, yeah, it's a good a good thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, that 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 music has has been a part of my it, 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 it's my soundtrack since the early '90s. So. Absolutely. But um. Uh, it, uh, kind of with that, uh, this this collective that happens is um, a few years ago, uh, Tim Bloom had this accident, and uh, everybody got together in the Bay Area, and we put on a benefit concert for him to help pay his astronomical medical bills, and to I would say really just bring some good vibes to a, a bad situation, and that was at that was at Terrapin Crossroads and it was in the, the great room. And we had all these amazing Bay area musicians, um, playing, uh, you know, for this benefit. And I brought, um, the band that I was playing with at the time and will always be a part of this band, lazy man. Um, we were, I think we were doing, it was like the second year we were doing a George Harrison, uh, birthday bash in February. And, you know, one year we did All Things Must Pass in its entirety. The next year, um, I think we did the concert for Bangladesh. And for this thing, for this benefit, we brought to, um, to the show like a 12 or 13 piece <clears throat> excuse me, band to play like four songs <clears throat> excuse me, for, um, for Tim. And you get on the stage and it's pretty mellow out there and everybody's hanging out and all of a sudden we busted into uh wawa and we truly did go for this this you know specter wall of sound just beating barrages oh, i dig of, dig of i dig it. oh yeah yeah it's huge and 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 here we are there's great energy everywhere <clears throat> excuse me we're throwing it out there and all of a sudden, like, Phil's in the back of the room, like, standing on a chair. And everybody <laughs> is just, I'll, I'll never forget. And the amount of energy going back and forth was incredible. I mean, that, <clears throat> you know, that to me, I mean, there was a lot of emotion in the air as well because you were doing it uh, for, your, sure. for your buddy. But, I mean, I, I guess how in any band uh, that you've been a part of for a while, um, how is it about listening to each other and getting into uh, a cosmic kind of almost intergalactic space? How, how do you put yourselves, I'm talking outside of like something that is already, you know, sure. emotive, like, you know, with this accident, you know, you're trying to mend your friend, you're trying to help him. You know, there's already a lot of like, you know, so I'm just talking about in general. I, I mean, because sure. Michael Shreve told me he's like, "How do you expect the audience to go there if you don't go there first? And is there, is it just is it unquantifiable? Is it just something that happens when you get out of your own way, or is there kind of a a, a little bit of a formula to to getting to that point where you can start to inspire the audience? Well, I, I think it's a, a bit of everything. I, I think getting out of your way is a great way of putting it. I mean, you have total preconceived notions of how the show is going to go. Oh, there's so many people out there. This is going to rock. Why does that matter that there's so many people? Out there? Exactly. Or you have, um, 
on the other side of it that, oh, I can't wait to go to the show. This is my favorite band. It's going to be so great. It might not be great. So putting those limitations and those, uh, those ideas of what something that hasn't happened is going to be is, is ridiculous. If you go and you're like, ah, I'm excited. I, I think I'm going to have a fun time tonight. Let's see what happens. Um, either as a performer or as a, a concert goer listener, I think that's the best space to be in. You, if, I like going on the stage and one, maybe not even knowing what I'm playing, but two, not really thinking about it. Just like, oh, okay, it's go time. Let's get up there and see what happens. So getting out of your way, I would say, is like is number one most important. And and I'm also, it sounds like, it sounds to me like n- no expectations, right? I mean, just no no preconceived expectations going in. Um, just kind of t- totally trying to stay present in the moment. Yeah, be be prepared. I mean, if you're if you're going to a concert, eat some food. <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're getting up on stage, eat some food earlier. It, it's I, I think that's it. Just go up there prepared to, to do what you do. And, and I think everybody is going to have an amazing time. Talking to Brian Rashap here. He's a little bit under the weather, but he's fighting through it here on the Jake Feinberg <laughs> show. But uh, I, we, we have a game on this program called name that voice. Um, whether you get it or not is irrelevant, but I pay attention to the content and then we'll uh, come back and break it down. Yeah. Yeah. And then I started paying attention more. And then when I started getting gigs with Phil, Obviously, I had to because I had to learn the song. <laughs> and uh, the idea of learning, I would learn the song. I'd learn the record. Right. Okay, I got it. Right. You know? And then we'd get to rehearsal or the sound check, and he'd be like, no, no. You know, we're going to lose all that bit, and we're going to do this. I love it. Oh, and, I love it. I love it. And we're going to completely change it up. And different things like uh, the length of notes and stuff. And he would look at a room and say, well, this is a short room, so we should try and play short notes tonight you know, stuff like that that i never even thought about and he would get on the mic while we we're playing and say all right everybody play long notes now so there's these there's these small uh small rules that you adhere to and if everybody is on the same page he would just manage to put everybody on the same page it didn't have to be like you have to play it like this or you have to do this it was more like here's the here's the concept for the next 10 minutes here's just a small concept i run with it and everybody play in that with that thought in mind very simple stuff but i'd never thought about it like that and that really opened my head so between chris between knowing that chris could easily lay back in his laurels and play the songs like the record and everyone would be happy and no one would care the fact that he fought to always change things up and make them new and fresh and the fact that Phil had been doing that for another 20 years beyond Chris, you know, just never afraid to walk into a, a room or a stage and, and just say, hey, we're not doing that. We're doing this. You haven't taken a guess at who that is? I have no idea. That is uh, the keyboardist, current keyboardist for uh, the Chris Robinson Brotherhood is uh, Adam McDougal. Uh, that was my, for my interview with him. January of 2019, and I was I was asking him how he originally met Tony Leone, the drummer, and he said, you know, we were playing these gigs with Phil, and Phil yeah. turned him his mind upside down. I mean, and and the reason I played that for you is because, you know, it's this sort of I could only imagine, and I never saw the Grateful Dead. I was too young, and and I don't know if I necessarily wanted to see them in the in the 90s but that being said the idea that he's talking about like oh it feels like this is a short room so let's play shorter notes or this is a longer room right. you know and it's like and i'm thinking i'm like what was going on during sound check in like 83 phil was obvious i mean i have become more and more convinced that uh well i don't think any i mean i think jerry was pretty much i'll you know, I'll play whatever. I'm just listening, and I'll keep soloing because I this stuff keeps coming out of me. Um, sure. f- Phil, to me, uh, was the the mad scientist. I mean, if they were at the Spectrum or if they were in playing in a in, at Barton Hall, he was clearly the, the one saying, "No, you know, it's a shorter hall. We got to play shorter notes." D- was that? Can you talk about some kind of like, you know, the way maybe um, 
the the Zen mastery of Phil Lesh that that wasn't in your repertoire, so to speak, before you before you came across him? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for me, I, I've always I, I, and I've and I've changed at this point probably because of Phil, but I always used to feel like, um, for better or for worse whatever amp I'm playing through, whatever way that the, the tonal shaping has, has gone on the amp, I'm going to sound like me. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. There's of course things that will be variables, but um, it, it's still going to be me playing. And I, I was just almost like a plug and go kind of guy. Like, let's just figure it out as, as we're going, we'll be three, four or five songs in. And then I'll, I'll Oh, you know, wow. I'm really, overpowering this frequency like this or whatnot. <laughs> by the way th by the way that on the track we came in with cities you obviously have yeah. your own sound i mean it's 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 your own you sound like yourself yeah well it, well that's the funny thing with terrapin it's like uh, yeah and i've got my pedals and and my who dads but um mesa boogie who who's the amplifier company i've used for for decades they're kind enough or were kind enough to put in a bunch of Mesa Boogie stuff into Terrapin so now I could just like show up and play I don't have to like deal with lugging my gear um, so it's there it's I'm kind of it's a little bit easy for me because it's definitely something I'm used to playing but um, I digress with Phil you know I'm, I'm his production manager at this point and bass tech and so we we set up the room and we get all the gear going and before the band comes in for a sound check, Phil comes in and tweaks his rig for however long he wants or needs. So literally he's taking this incredible tone, this incredible sound that's already there. And then he's going to spend 30 plus minutes making sure it's perfect for that room. So it's pretty, it's pretty crazy as, as you called him like mad scientist on it. That's, completely what he is i mean here's a guy who's been doing this forever yeah and could just show up plug in play walk off the stage with a shake of a thank you from his hand and go home instead he's going to be there early before the band to make sure that that one frequency or that one note he can cut off when he wants it to or he can make it longer when he wants it to or he can do whatever he wants so since this this amazing job that I've been able to do for him or with him I'm now the guy like sitting there I'm like oh that frequency is really ringing hard maybe I should see what I can do and dial that in instead of saying you know screw it I'm just going to go with it and it'll be what it will be so there's definitely this mad scientist thing from Phil that I would love to walk away with a bit of in myself where I can have the patience to deal with stuff like that it's great i mean he's a what's that no i just i mean it's i i mean it's a pretty could, could you explain how you actually walked into this kind of gig i mean by the way there's also i phil does not, i mean <laughs> i was yelling i was at a uh, I, I gotta tell you the story off air but um i was at uh, uh terrapin uh, did a facebook live with elliot and graham and then uh there was a concert with with uh, Melvin Seals, Molo, Barry Sless, Phil. Uh, I think Lebo was there. It was burning, and uh, you know, there's a. Have you ever? Phil doesn't. It was not in his in his uh, in his biography, auto whatever the book he wrote. You know, searching for the sound. Uh, there was, you know, he was in one side band during his Grateful Dead years, and I'm not sure if he really wants anybody to know about it. Do you know about it? Uh, I do. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it, to me, it's always had the lore of like that uh, that Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> okay, first of all, the the because I've interviewed all the cats in the band. It was, the band was called Too Loose to Truck. Right. Too and, Loose to Truck. Too Loose exactly. to Truck. So he, I mean, it was uh, Steve Mitchell on drums and John Allaire on piano. Um, and Terry Haggerty from the Sons of Champlin, freaking badass. I mean, it was, it, and there are some right. amazing recordings of that group, and uh, and it's wild. Um, but I wonder about, um, you know, 
let me read you this uh, this quote from uh, that I from my interview with Alan Toussaint, and then I want you to, based on what you just talked about with Phil tuning up way, well before the band gets there, how he modulates between the 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 meter the the to, the the tuning and the heart. And this is what Toussaint told me. He said. Yeah. He said, even the tuning of the instrument has changed music. You need a meter to get things done. When before you used to read your heart, some of the stuff that you found out in the tuning is what made you, you. After a while, we began to look at a needle. I'm not saying it would be good to play out of tune, but out of tune isn't always out of tune. Once you begin to operate on this very thin straight line and quote unquote, now we're ready to go, you're ready to go because that meter dictated you're ready to go. It is correct that it is totally in tune, but if you're not careful, your m life of music can become that way. How does what does Brian Rashap uh, say to that? Uh, just riff on that uh, free association. Um, there's a there's a few things. There's I mean, one thing with Toussaint, uh, he was definitely dealing with the piano, which I, I think being in tune is a pretty good idea. Um, I know that, that like family man Barrett, uh, believes, and it, it's actually pretty cool. If you look at it, when you walk around that the earth is tuned to E flat, like that's, that's, that's the heart of the earth. So that's pretty interesting. If you think of the fact that guitars are tuned, the standard tuning is an E. Um, also, it, to, like a guitar, you know, like Zappa says, the guitar is a pretty stupid instrument. I mean, you tune all the strings separately and you go to play an open chord or a, a fretted chord and it's out of tune. So how is that? So then you have to take the good and the bad and make little differences in each string to make uh, like a D chord sound proper or perfect. Um, Tuning with Phil, he likes to tune notes on the neck and in areas that he usually plays around it. And I've noticed that that's a really good way, and I've actually sort of changed the way that I tune to that to, to get around because most notes and the neck is going to be in tune at that point. Just going. You know What's no, that? this is unbelievable. I mean, the, I just want you to focus on the heart part of it. I mean, there's no one – when I listen to early 80s Live Dead, it's the only thing I play for my daughters in the car. I mean, it's ferociously insane music. It gets overlooked all the time. But when Phil's on, the band is on, and he is playing heart, heart, fire, love. So how – in your in your mind, not so much – with. I mean, you said Phil comes in early and he – will spend as much time as he wants getting right. the right sound. But how does he get in, how does the heart, as a non-musician, I just want you to talk to the peeps out there and myself about how to incorporate the heart because we have all this technology to make everything perfect now. I think with the heart, if you, if you, it, everything is going to be in tune if you just go with the heart. It, it's not, if it feels good to you, that's perfect. That, you can't change that. You can't make that better. Perfect is perfect. So I think... When, like, how do I say this? The, the best thing, it's going to be, everything will be in tune at that point. I think you can tune to how you feel. That is, I mean, is that something that has been an evolution for you? I, I feel like you were sort of talking about, about that a little bit. But can you talk about your evolution as it relates to tuning to you as opposed to being in the same tuning? That's, I guess that, that was the thing that resonated with me and sort of bothers me about the formula trip of just – I don't want to be too general, but you know, if you're not careful, sure. your life of music can become that way. You know, I mean, that, that to me is the danger of it. Yeah. You know, and I want how, – how do you tune to your how – you, how have you learned to tune to your, to your mood? I, I think it it rolls back on the the preconceived notions and 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 being open uh, to receive what's happening at the time. I think if you go in to it feeling this is what's going to happen, this is what I, I I'm so excited about this, 
you're not going to be in tune to your heart. You're not going to be in tune. All of it's going to be out. Hang on, I'm going to cough really bad right now. Hang on. <laughs> it's fine. Go ahead. Um, it is about letting go of what you think you know. It is about going with the moment. It's, it's, it's being completely present. You just, I think you just quoted Sophocles or something, you know, you have to know what you don't know or something, you know? <laughs> I think you really do. I mean, there's too much of my life. I, I think I've, I've felt that, uh, and this is like the old me thinking, but I, I, I think that I knew what should be and knew how to go about it. And I realized, um, probably like seven years ago that, that I didn't and that, uh, it was time to, uh, stop pretending that I did and, and open up. And since then, I think, uh, the world has really been like, all right, you're ready. And here you go. Try this, try this. So <laughs> that's, I mean, could, could yeah. you, it, it, was there kind of a demarcation point at that seven years? Is there a, an exa- a specific time that you can talk about where, um, it was very evident to you that, um, the insecure way was actually the secure way. Yeah, I think I, for me, I, um, in, in like 2011, my, my first marriage fell apart for reasons that are way beyond, uh, like an interview at this point. And of course, uh, I, I had to, to change what I thought I knew and the way that I went about things. And, uh, by doing that, it, it almost made me realize and brought up to, um, brought to my mind, like, okay, what is important? What's important to you? What do you want to do? What do you feel like you should be doing? And, uh, and where do you feel like you should be? And, and with that, everything else opened up strange, like strangely enough, you know, uh, from that and from that experience, I am where I am today, and I'm doing things that I love. I am madly in love with my wife and my children and my dog here and my <clears throat> excuse me and my uh, my life. And I think that's that's just the way it has to go for some people. Things have to fall apart. Um, whether by your hand or by somebody else's hand, you know, in my, uh, experience, it, it wasn't by my hand, but, uh, things have to, there, there's, that was the catalyst. Something has to happen to make you see things in a different light. I think you're a hundred percent right. I just, I'm, I'm thinking that when you were at the bottom of the pit, which Pat Martino says is the, the best place to be, because there's only one way to go and that's up, um, is, uh, what did you say to the, how did you answer those questions of what do I really want to do? Uh, it wasn't like, you know, you didn't meet your, your current wife right away. I mean, you know, I mean, setting personal stuff yeah. aside, what did, what were the answers to those questions you just riffed on? Well, I think the answers were, you know, at that point I was in a, uh, my main focus for income or for livelihood was like a, a corporate job. And it wasn't necessarily that being miserable kind of doing it. Um, yes, I had some great friends in that, you know, at that job. And, and actually, it's, when we're done, I'm having lunch with a bunch of them today. But mentally, I wasn't being fulfilled. I wasn't being fulfilled in what I was doing at my job. And, and now being able to play music full time and having done that since then, um, I'm a much happier person. I feel I feel more fulfilled uh, in my career. Was it? And were you Were you playing? Were you involved at all uh, in music? I mean, because the corporate oh, yeah. the corporate gig is a burn. But I mean, how did how much did it accelerate? How and and ultimately, how did you tap into this? Uh, I mean, the one thing I really res- I mean, I the one thing I love about Phil. I mean, is that you know, he did the 50 year anniversary shows, but like he's what he's done by creating Terrapin Crossroads 
is a, he's created a regional venue for cats. I don't care if it's Scott Metzger from the East Coast or you guys sure. or whatever. It's like he's he's giving people an opportunity to play live. That's how you're going to get comfortable with your own yeah. individual sound. And to me, I applaud that more than than going out on dead tour you know like i mean that's been done i respect right, it right. incredibly at the highest level but how did you actually so what was the i don't want to say it was a break but i mean like when you left this job that provided financial security and clearly you were <clears throat> you know you know stagnant you know uh, spiritually and social and, and mentally like you said um who did you fall in with uh, musician wise uh, how did you become part of this uh this is a Bay Area psychedelic enclave. <laughs> well, for me, I, I had been playing in, um, I've always played music uh, since, you know, I was seven, if, if not even before. Actually, my dad and I were just talking about this, uh, or my dad and my wife were talking about it, how I used to, when I was like two or three, I'd jump up and down on my folks' bed, singing a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll into like a, fake microphone no oh, i love it i'd love uh, to see video of that yeah yeah, yeah I'm, I'm so glad there's no <laughs> facebook back then um and so i've always done music i've always played it um having this corporate job uh i was still playing all the time and at that point i was uh i was playing with uh my buddy steve pyle in and james stafford in this band lazy man and lazy man uh from gigs that we did i had i had met the guys that were in this band tiny television um which were you know jeremy d'antonio and danny luring and at some point started playing with them as that band was becoming san geronimo and played with them for a few years. We played a gig, I think, at Terrapin at like the end of 2013. And at one point, uh, my friend C Max Band needed a bass player for a gig as a fill in. And that was at Terrapin, and I did that. And somehow from there, it just kind of, you know, became this tumbleweed where I ended up playing there all the time i think ross james hired me for something and then i became like the house bassist for a bit uh for a while and so that's kind of how i became a part of this this terrapin thing i, I think also kind of being one of the older guys there i'm 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 turning 44 next month um, yeah we're this dude, that's not that's the that's the new 26 bro come on it yeah it is the new 26 it, it's <laughs> it's funny how like at 41 you do start feeling things You're like oh that's not going away yeah right um <laughs> but uh yeah at, at that point um it was it was just something where i started doing it i've, I've always felt and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with this like i i like kind of being thrown into the fire um you know, the early days of my involvement at Terrapin Crossroads, we weren't even using iPads yet. We were just like, we're going to play these songs. There's no, there's no set list. There's no song list before the show. And for me, it's like, uh, I, don't, I don't know that song. I've never heard that song. What is it? Oh, it's, it's these six, seven chords or whatnot. Now you're fully open. There's, there's, there's nowhere for you to hide. You're the kid that, took a little too many mushrooms and you had to go into Carl's Jr. to order a burger because you think you're hungry and three people behind you is an <laughs> off-duty cop that's getting ready to order and you're just freaking balling oh, out man. Yo, but Hoko, I, I want to stop you right there. I, this, I'm so glad you brought that up because, and you can push back on this if you want, but I was there, um, I was at, at the bar, Tavern Crossroads, a couple months ago I, and, and I've seen other cats doing it I even see Stu do it. I mean, I was at this little coffee house bar that he was playing out with Seekru and, and Guberman and, and Greg Anton. And I, there's so. Oh, yeah, over at the. Uh, Full Sail. It was a, I forget the name oh, of yeah. it. It was right next to the Phoenix there. That was, it was just how it just yeah, went yeah. down. And, you know, he's got the lyrics out to uh, Mrs. Robinson. And, you yeah. know, I, you know and, and, and it, you know, I am trying to figure out. 
To me, what you just said is exact. I'm not saying go in unprepared and be a mess. You don't want to sure. be a, a mess, but why the need for the technology? Because it, to me, it's like it, it almost stunts the ability. I would. I'm. A, I come from the school where I don't even think you should be clapping in between tunes. Because it interrupts right. the spiritual, okay? So I'm like a little bit, I'm a little, I know I'm a little bit off, but I'm a little bit out, you know? But I'm just saying that, why Why do you believe the iPads are a are necessity, necessity on the bandstand? Because to me, that part of it in the fire, when you're in the fire, that's the, the RB right. psychedelic experience, man. That's where these, that's where Phil Lesh came from. I mean, they were actually tripping on acid the whole time. But, I mean, it was, you know, it was just during the acid test. But explain to me the benefits of it. Because what what I'm really getting at is that, like, um, and, and Stu is not a great example because the dude is, is just out there cranking everywhere and, and giving people hope. And But, you know, it took it took 10 minutes for him. It, there, was, there was a 10-minute break uh, just to figure out, just to scroll through the iPad to figure out what tune he wanted to play. And it just sort of took away from sure. the – just I'm saying, like, what you just described is what it should be about. And sure. you can just riff on that any way you want. I just would rather people be totally naked on the stage. Not, you know, not literally, but figuratively. Right. No, and that's – it's it's our jobs up there when we're nervous to think of everybody in the audience as naked. Um, I would <laughs> say that there's – it would be great if we all knew – Oh, yes, Mac. Hi, buddy. Sorry, I got a paw to my face right here. Hi. Um, I would say that it's great to not need a chart or, the, or an I, iPad. I, would, I, I want people to think of an iPad, though, as just a chart, as, as just a, a sheet of music. So you've got your classical PNS2s up there. They probably don't need the music but it's right in front of them just in case they do the ipad is this times version of that for for all of us when we get on a stage and we're just going to go for it um there's so many variables there's literally uh, i don't know 15 20 different versions that we've all heard of different people playing the same song. So it, it almost, it, it levels the field to where you're all starting, dude, stop, Max. You're all starting to. He's very low. He's, he's actually, you're ignoring him. He's, he wants he's, attention. He wants uh, your attention. He's a two year old, 105 pound Bernie. Oh dear God. Yeah. Well just let him know. We'll yeah. be done real soon. So don't, tell him not to worry. Yeah. He, um, it, it's something where, you want to start with the same thing. All right, we're all going to build our own house. What are we going to start with? Well, let's, let's make sure that where we're building is flat. So everything is going to be stable. I think it also is good because you, nobody's going to, nobody's getting one of those really weird surprises. When we're jam, if we're jamming and we're getting out there and, and, and we're in the moment, I still don't want to confuse you. I do want to throw that wrench in there, but I don't want to make it to where you turn to me and you go, Whoa, what the hell is that? I want you to turn to me and go, see what that iPad is for, I would say, in a general usage form on a stage. For me and for, for people, for bass players, I don't believe that we have the luxury to wait. I feel like we need to be there um, on the one we need it, it, it it's it's really like Bootsy Collins he's saying like funk starts it's on the one that's the first thing you do everything in between is different but that one that hit needs to be there so for somebody performing their own song that they've written and I don't I've never heard it before if I at least can look at that chord chart and know that you know measure one is a G measure two is a D thing measure three is a E minor whatever it is I want to be able to support you and the the salt and pepper that you're going to put on top of that base right there, um, B A S E not B A S S. But right, right, right. So right. I I I like that um, 
I like having some sort of a chord chart there so I can make everybody else's job easier. Now, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm 44 and I've been playing music forever. I remember when it was a handwritten chart and I remember sitting in front of a stereo and rewinding the tape to get that path again, to, to, to get, to try to learn the song. So I don't need a chart up there. And that's really for me where I want to be. Once that stuff is internalized, then I can move throughout it or move away from it. Playing with the mother hips, uh, I'm coming into this, enormous catalog of, of recorded songs and live songs. Their songs aren't, I mean, they're, the hips isn't a jam band. It's not something where it's like, just go for it. These are pretty tight knit songs. And so for me, staring at a chart and trying to play this music isn't doing the music justice. I'm, I want to go old school with it. I'm at this point, I'm internalizing all these tunes and I want to go from memory. I don't, I don't want to chart. I want to be there on the stage in the moment playing this music. So I, I get the part about no charts, but I also really get the part about having charts. Songs like, you know, I've, with Stu, I've, I've, we've played and I've been singing um, Unbroken Chain a bit. And here's a song that I know for the life of me, I, I will never have the, the capacity to remember all those words, nor the little differences in each pass, uh, you know, music wise and need that chart and that cheater to be able to look at it as I'm trying to sing and play this really amazingly awkward, strange song. So <laughs> I know. I mean, you're, I, you're, I, I you're, you're, you're no, I mean, it's, it's, did you, by the way, um, how long have you been playing with the, the hips? Uh, the hits, I've really been playing with them since, gosh, um, I think in August we played a good friend's wedding and then uh, did a couple shows in Chico. And then so, yeah, since like August, I'd say. Were you, I mean, because it's funny, I think, I, I think I, I'm so honored to have seen Rash App. I, I, maybe you were there. I cannot totally, it was kind of. It was a different kind of gig. It was uh, December 16th at Slim's. It was an acoustic. Oh, yeah. Were you there? Yeah. Oh, my. Where, I mean, you, I got I got to send you these videos, dude. This is incredible. I mean, Loya, it was like an acoustic kind of thing. But it was, I mean, you were, were you yeah. Were you just playing guitar? Were you, I didn't even know if there was a bass player there. Yeah, I was, I was playing bass. I was, um, that weekend was our hipsmiths, which is. Exactly just the term where it's a couple shows at great American uh, Friday. I think we did the ultimate set list show Saturday was just a, thank God we got through that last night. Let's just play a show. show. <laughs> right. And then uh, Sunday is the, the kid matinee. Uh, yeah. That's what that's the vibe was. Yeah, so was, chill. I, I'm going to send you this. I got I'm, I'm tagging you in this video. Cause I mean, it was yeah. cathartically. I mean, again, the piano player was, the the iPad was right there. He didn't. I don't know if he was a regular cat to the band. He seemed like he was kind of um, working the tunes out on the fly. But um, I mean, it's a bit of both. It's it's a four piece band. Eisenberg being the fifth man. Watching him play is incredible. Like his fingers are just like mutating the like draw bars, and then his other hand is going crazy on the keys. It's it's awesome. Um, yeah. Well, no, I mean. Um, a couple things we've got to definitely do a part two uh, we've already been cooking for 50 minutes here but yeah. um, do we ever see Brian Rashep on the upright bass you can yeah I, I played it for a while did a, a bit in college and then afterwards I it's kind of funny but going back to that corporate gig when I uh uh was I, I worked for this company that makes outdoor gear marmot and was on the computer all day long and then playing music all the time my hand I, my just blew out like my forearms and my hands but as i walk into my son my 10 year old elliot's room like in the room is actually my double bass so 
it's out. It's in the stand, and I've been screwing around with it a bit. So it'll be coming back. I recognize that the I recognize that the muscles are completely different. What you have to work on between the the electric and the upright. Um, I just feel yeah, like, like thirty pounds of pressure in first position. That's crazy. Well, I just to me, there's something. Uh, the, the the thing is, it, and and I'd have to study you a little bit more. But it, you know, the hardest thing about, I mean, Putter Smith, who's a great upright bass player. You know, he was he yeah. wasn't the. Um, <clears throat> for a minute he uh well no there was a period of time in the 70s you know kind of before we were even you know birthed you know where you know he would be running down to like he'd get a, a call from woody herman you know that he that they needed a, a sub bass player and he'd run down there with his upright and woody's like why why'd you bring that thing you know why not the electric it was yeah. almost like it was almost like band the uh, the acoustic was banned but the truth is you can get your own intonation on the upright i don't need to tell you this but you okay. could really get your own intonation on that as opposed to the electric it's a little bit harder to uh really define who you are to hear who you are exactly you know oh yeah no it's a and and on an upright or any instrument that's uh fretless each note is different depending on what key you're playing if you're in g and you're playing a, a, a g major scale that that the third, the B note, is going to be a slightly different place than if you're playing an E major scale. It's very, it's really interesting. I had um, um, a really cool teacher for a while, uh, this kid a lot younger than me that, that was teaching me this stuff, and he gave me these, uh, these drones to listen to while I ran scales. And you do, you notice, you're like, wait, this B is in a different place in this scale than wow. this other wow. scale. It's, wow. it's pretty crazy. Wow. But. No, I, I mean, it yeah, just, it, it would be, I mean, it would be uh, just, I'd like to see a little more upright bass in the, in the, at least in the, in the, in the, not, maybe not in the great room, but in the, in the bar area. It would be great. You know, a little, maybe uh trapless. Uh, do you also, I mean, are you comfortable? Pl I'm curious about playing with a, in a, not without a trap drummer. I mean, uh, you know, John Kahn did it for oh, a long yeah. You you enjoy that feeling too? I mean, without playing with drums. I do. Yeah, I think um, I, I I feel like I get pretty percussive uh, without a drummer. I, I like to add those little ghosts. Even with a drummer, and some drummers don't like it. I'll add ghost notes in there that, to me, are are just reminiscent of a of a kit and of a drummer actually being there. So I love doing that type of stuff. The, uh, the yeah the more the more the more ghost notes the better I when 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 is what are the when is Rash App when are you guys playing or what, like what like I, I gotta come and we gotta catch a hang and, and do a do a, a Facebook live interview I just what, what kind of gigs you got coming up yeah. you know at this point um, well I think Monday on the 18th I'm playing I'm doing a, a Grateful Monday at Terrapin um, but other than that it's it's a ton of hip states. When we go down to, uh, we're at the Belly Up on the 22nd, and then St. Rock, and Belly Up is in uh, Solana Beach, and then St. Rock in Hermosa Beach on the 23rd. The next week, we go out to and do a little southeast run, Nashville, Atlanta, uh, the Carolinas, and then... Uh, how about how about the Southwest? Like, why do we why do we get dissed? I mean, get to the Southwest. I don't know. We uh, we just did Utah, and I think we're doing Colorado a little later this year. But uh, we'd love to have you. We just love stuff. to have you down there, AZ. Either flag or or uh, you'd come down to Tucson. There's uh, it would just be cool to have you guys come 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 down here. Yeah, I'll I'll talk to the boys and see what we can put together. Yeah, you talk to Loy O'Connell and let me know. But uh, but yeah, man, it was it was uh, uh, it was really great to hang. And let's let's plan on doing a part two, uh, if not in person, uh, on the radio uh, real soon. I'd love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had a ball, man. And uh, go have a great day and uh, keep doing your thing, man. It was, it was an honor. Right on. Thanks so much, dude. It was a total honor on this side too. All right, dude. Be good. All right. Take it easy. Later. Dude. Bye. Another member of the Terrapin family, Brian Rashap. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. Big, big day, three interviews. We'll be around. Peace. Mm -hmm.